name is Marcy Goldstein, and I'm a member of the, I'm from Miami, and I'm a member of the National Women's Division Council of Israel Bonds. I also happen to be married to chairman of the board, but that's a subject for another Zoom call. Shalom and welcome to all of you, dedicated Israel Bond supporters from throughout the world who are joining us today. In a year in which we are commemorating the 70th anniversary of Bonds, we take pride in the global scope of the Bonds enterprise and most especially the $46 billion and counting that has been provided through Israel throughout the decades. Thank you for being a part of that remarkable legacy. For 11 terrifying days and nights, the skies above Israel were filled with more than 4,300 terrorist rockets launched from Gaza. Yet, despite the ever-present danger, the resolute Israel spirit, the Jewish state's most defining characteristic, remained strong and unbroken. Throughout the conflict, thousands of Israel supporters expressed solidarity in the most tangible way possible through investments in Israel bonds. If you have already acquired a bond in support of Israel, thank you. If you have not yet done so, please consider making an Israel bond purchase as your personal expression of unity. Visit your applicable Israel bonds website or call your regional bonds office to learn more. As we meet, the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas continues to hold, yet many questions remain, not only about the conflict itself, but also what comes next. To help us sort out the complexities of the situation, Israel Bonds has arranged for us to hear from Alon Ben David, Senior Defense Correspondent for Israel's Channel 13. Alon, who has been covering the Middle East conflict for more than three decades, specializes in defense and military issues. With a reputation as one of Israel's leading journalists, Elan is a frequent contributor to numerous, numerous international publications. Following his briefing, Elan will take questions. I now turn the program over to Elan Ben David. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marcy, and, and heartwarming to see uh, <clears throat> all of you here in these tough times for Israel, as you see across the world. Um, I'll try to quickly brief you about what we have been going through um, and, and not go over to other uh, issues other than Gaza. And I'll start from the end. We are three days after the declaration of a ceasefire. Complete calm is in the south. However, the border crossings to Gaza are still shut down. Only a few trucks with humanitarian aid are allowed to go in. And today, the Prime Minister approved the policy recommended by our military uh, to, to uh, condition the reconstruction of Gaza in advancing a prisoner swap in return for the two Israeli dead soldiers and the two living civilians who are being held inside Gaza. Basically, that means that we are about to deny Gaza from concrete, from iron, from everything that is required for the reconstruction. And at least according to my experience, and I hear that echoes echoing as well in the military establishment, that means that we will most likely go into a renewed hostilities within a few days, maybe for another round of fighting. And the IDF, as we speak, is preparing for another round of fighting, because as we've seen it before, after a few days, when things will become desperate inside Gaza, um, fire balloons will be launched from the Gaza Strip, Israel will retaliate, rockets will fly again, and quickly we are on the slope back into another conflict. So I would say that most of the people dealing with Gaza right now do not look at the ceasefire as something that we will be able to sustain considering the policy that we have adopted. So, so that's where we stand now. Now let's go back for a second for, and go through quickly those 11 days of campaign, guardian of the walls, as it was called. We failed to detect a change that happened inside Hamas. For seven years, Hamas, under the leadership of Yechel Sinwar, was seeking agreement, is a, is a strong word, was seeking some kind of arrangement with Israel that would allow Gaza to exist uh, economically independent. Israel was quite slow in that. And Yahya Sinwa was elected, almost barely elected, 
to become the, the uh, once again the leader of Hamas because his contenders blamed him that he's uh, neglecting jihad. And apparently Hussein Ward changed his mind. And seeing the events in Jerusalem, now a few words about Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, we have a 12 years long civilian dispute between Jews and Arabs, Jews who represent those who purchased the land back in the 19th century, and a few dozen Palestinian families who are living on those lands since uh, 1948. And the court has been the, uh, listening to this case and is about to uh, publish his, uh, his verdict, <coughs> excuse me, his verdict. And that created some unrest in the last few weeks that combined with Ramadan, there was a collision of uh, uh, dates here, combined with Ramadan, inflamed Temple Mount. Hamas recognized that opportunity. And Monday, exactly two weeks ago, he surprised us. And he launched a surprise salvo of rockets on Jerusalem, on our capital, in Jerusalem Day, generating pictures like our parliament, the Knesset being evacuated from legislators and the Kotel being evacuated from worshipers. And the, the uh, flag dance stopped in Jerusalem. By that salvo, Hamas has already uh, accumulated three strategic achievements. First, he appeared as the guardian of Jerusalem in the Arab world. He's protecting the mosques, the holy sites. Second, he became the inspiration for the West Bank and for the Israeli Arabs in Israel who went to the streets after that to um, clash with Jews and with the Israeli police. We've been able to restore calm in those areas and by the way, unlike many commentators in Israel, I do not see that as the end of coexistence between Jews and Arabs. I remind us all that many nations experienced the margins exploding with frustration. You know, Paris was burning for a few weeks with the yellow vests a few years ago, and your own capital was taken over by rioters uh, uh, half a year ago. So those kind of things happen. I think what we saw on the streets were mostly the margins of the Israeli Arab society. And I believe that we can restore not only calm, but coexistence because we have no choice. However, as I said, on that single evening, Hamas has already, already accumulated several strategic achievements. And the last one is restoring the Palestinian issue high on the world agenda of public opinion. And that's still there. In Israel, a campaign that was prepared a long time ago and very well prepared was launched following the salvo on Jerusalem. And Israel decided to pull out a tool that was developed within the IDF for major war, for a large war in which we need to maneuver into Lebanon. That tool, which was created by really ingenuity of our Air Force and engineers, enabled us to destroy Hamas underground network from the air by using precision weapons, penetrating those underground uh, tunnels in a certain angle, we were able to start systematically destroying all of Hamas underground infrastructure. Now, I I've seen that in my, with, with my eyes in the last war, in 2014, underneath Gaza, there is another underground city Imagine an underground city where you have wide avenues and then streets are splitting from the avenues and then alleys, uh, small alleys are splitting from the streets. In between, in those crossings, you have resting rooms, you have uh, headquarters, you have communication rooms, you have lines of communications, electricity and air supply installed throughout this massive network totaling 230 miles of underground tunnels. We have started destroying that. And that was a major surprise for Hamas because that is the realm in which Hamas is prepared to fight. And once we have denied that of the underground realm, they had to go up on the ground where they are vulnerable to our attacks. Despite dealing them severe blows, 
on their infrastructure, on their ability to produce rockets. Hamas was able to launch a massive amount of rockets on our communities, totaling 4,400 4, in 11 days. That's quite a lot. This is the total number of rockets launched against us in 52 days of war in 2014. That is the total number of rockets launched by Hezbollah in, in 33 days in Lebanon, 2006. And then they, they did it in, in 11 days. That's a firepower that begins to resemble the firepower of Hezbollah. And they were able to produce those rockets despite the fact that Gaza is still under blockade. Now, Gaza really are the masters of ingenuity because as they say, the, the necessity is the mother of ingenuity. And they were able to produce quite effective rockets that were striking all over Israel and basically shutting down two thirds of the country. Two thirds of Israel were not functioning normally in those 11 days. And of course, communities in the South suffered a lot. I don't know how many of you got to visit in the South. Just bear in mind a day, I've witnessed a day like that in Ashkelon during the campaign, where you have 50 air raid sirens during the day, 50. That means that every 15 minutes you need to run for shelter. And by the way, you have 15 seconds to run for shelter. You know what troubles the people in the South the most? The shower. Nobody, nobody wants to get caught in the shower naked with soap when you have 15 minutes to run for shelter. Imagine living like that. Despite the vast number of rockets fired on us, Iron Dome was able to negate most of them, providing amazing protection for the people of Israel. If we have, and we have entered that campaign with a total number of casualties, which is 12. One of them is a serviceman. 11 are civilians hit by rockets or civilian being hurt by, while running for shelter. On the other side, Hamas has more than 200 dead, and they are still digging out the dead that they got buried in the tunnels. We have about 150 civilians killed. Now, that may sound like a lot to you. I don't know how much you know Gaza. If you, if you just open one time a, a, a satellite a photo of Gaza, Gaza is the most dense area in the world. And Hamas is operating as a negative to the rules of war. Exactly what the rules of war are, are uh, uh, abiding us, Hamas is doing exactly the opposite. And rules of war say you don't fire from civilian areas, they fire from civilian areas in order to get more civilians killed. And, and rules of war say that you do not target civilians deliberately, they target civilians deliberately. They are operating exactly as the opposite of the rules of war. And we need to fight against that while respecting the rules of war. And I've seen, I spent one long night in, in uh, the underground headquarters of the IDF during the operation. And you should see the amount and the energy and the effort invested in each aerial strike in order to avoid civilian casualties. So a ratio of more, more than one to one one a militant over every one killed civilian, we got a better ratio, which is the best uh, compared to any of previous operations that we launched. Yet we see the international uh, reaction to that. And I believe that most people around the world do not really understand what's going on in Gaza. Now, we also, Israelis, do not fully understand what's going on, on in Gaza. Gaza we are not occupying Gaza for the last 16 years. We've withdrew from every inch of Gaza soil. Yet when we withdrew from Gaza in 2005, we have told the Gazans, our neighbors, you are not going to sail anywhere via sea. You're not going to fly anywhere via land. And you are not allowed to travel via land through my land. If the Egyptians would allow you to travel to theirs, so be it. And basically we locked them in a cage, a big cage, two million people. Somebody needs to feed the two million people in the cage, so we started providing Gaza with food, with gasoline, with cement that went to the tunnels, with iron that went to producing rockets. Why do we need that responsibility? 
my sense is that the Israeli government never sat down to decide on a strategy, as a long-term strategy on Gaza and what we are doing with this hostile territory, which is our neighbor. Now, since the last war, 2014, Hamas has been signaling to us as much as they could that they don't want to fight us, not because they like us. They said to us, Israelis, we hate you, but we don't want to fight you because we understand the, the balance of power. It's not in our interest to go to another war. But look at what's going on inside. People here are suffocating. We have more than 50% unemployment, which is a, you know, a number that, that decimates any human society in which more than 50% of the people have no way to provide for themselves and their family. We have no electricity. I don't know if you can imagine what it's like to live with five hours of electric power per day, how every family in Gaza is constantly calculating what they're going to do when power is back. They're going to connect the cell phone first and then put on the washing machine and then quickly warm the water for the baby because they cannot wash the baby with cold water. And above everything, they have no water. Gaza has drilled too much to the underground water. Salt water entered from the sea and when you open the tap in Gaza, in most cases, you get salt water. Now, the Gazans are a kind of people that no, mat no matter how much we try to persuade them, do not get used to living without water. No, really, what did we expect? So in the desperation, they, start, they started demonstrations. They started launching those fire balloons at our fields, burning our own fields on the other, on the other side. But then Israelis began to realize the hardship of Gaza and allowed Qatari money to go in. Every month, $50 million are going into Gaza, being uh, uh, provided to Gazan families, $100 each, and that keeps Gaza, I'd say, an inch above the sewage that Gaza is, is uh, swimming in. Now, we need to ask ourselves, and I do hope that the government, if it, with God's willing, we're going to have a new government, um, would pay attention to that, because we can go back to fight Gaza again and again. Gaza is no, no match to the capabilities of the IDF, and despite the fact that they've been um, pulling our nerves for the last two weeks at the end of the day. Yes, we are the strong party. We are protected. We have an air force. We have ground forces. And Hamas is no match to the IDF. But I believe that we need to ask ourselves, OK, these are my neighbors. They will not be friendly. They would not like me. But do we really have an interest to keeping them in distress with no ability to provide for themselves, with no ability to have their own economy. I hope that the next government would, will address these issues. But as I said, where we are today is that there are fair chances that we're going to see fighting being erupting again inside Gaza. And we'll see the idea of going for another round. I, bet, I do not believe that Gaza and Hamas will agree to a prisoner swap under the pressure that we are withholding them with from uh, essential materials for reconstruction. So my sense is, yes, that we are, we are on the countdown for another round. I hope I'm wrong, but we'll see as time goes by. So I said I'm going to speak for 15 minutes. I think I've exhausted my time, and I want to leave you some time for questions. So uh, Lee, will, you will facilitate that? Yes, I will. Thank okay. you, Alon. Um, we will now take a few questions. If anyone has a question, please uh, hit the hand icon on the bottom of the participant list. Please make sure your camera is on and I will call your name. Um, let's see, there are no questions at the moment. Um, Joel, Joel Cohen, please. Please make sure to accept the unmute request. You talk about- I hear you, Joel talk about the uh, prisoner swap. Why wouldn't Gaza, why wouldn't the Arabs agree to a mutual prisoner swap? There's no loss of face if they do that. Well, I'm basically sure they what they are, they are demanding Israel to release uh, convicted murderers and terrorists that are in our prisons. Now, I totally respect the approach of the Israeli prime minister who says, you know, I'm not trading live murderers 
for bodies of fallen soldiers. This needs to be more balanced. Now, at the end of the day, if you want a deal, yes, you will have to release prisoners. And really, this is, I think, there is no other tougher decision for an Israeli prime minister than a prisoner swap. Prisoner swap is the toughest decision ever for any Israeli prime minister because you're not talking about vague people sending soldiers, uh, unknown soldiers to their to the battle. You are talking about a concrete family which you need to look it in the eye and explain to that family why you are not or, or you are acting to return their kids home. So we, yes, we have a debt as a nation to the, to the Golding and Shaul families to return their fallen boys home to be buried in Israel. Now we're talking about the price. What would be the price? Unfortunately, I have to say, Joel, we missed a marvelous opportunity. Gaza being an, a, a territory which is closed from all directions was not hit hard by Corona first. For the first half, half a year, they had no disease. Then Corona hit them and hit them hard. Also hitting the leadership of Hamas. And when they were desperate, I thought, and many people in the IDF thought that we need to present Gaza with the vaccines and say, you want some vaccines? We have a humanitarian debt of our own. Return those fallen soldiers, return the two civilians that you are holding against their will, and we'll give you vaccines. We missed that. So now we will have to pay with prisoners. And being in an endless political elections campaign here in Israel does not really enable our decision makers to make a cold unpolitical judgment on issues like that. And everything in is influenced by the endless campaign that we are in. And I believe that hopefully if we will have a stabilized government unthreatened constantly by another elections, yes, there would be, there could be a better judgment and decision on how to solve that, uh, that miserable issue that needs to be solved by now. Thank you. Next question from John and Rose. Please make Thank you for the update, Alon. Uh, you mentioned in your in your talk that the people of Gaza made the rockets themselves. I had always assumed that Iran was smuggling in them in somehow, but were the people they actually have the technology and the the equipment to do that? Yes, they are amazing in in conditions of uh, you know total deprivation of almost all materials and all uh, um, machines, they are still able to use those dual use materials that we are allowing into Gaza to produce rockets and, and that allow them, enable them to produce 14,000 rockets since the last war under complete siege. You know, anybody who, who was in Gaza and yeah, some of you might have visited Cuba. You're, you've seen those 1940 something American cars running there without no American spare parts, but still going on. And, and when you lift the, the hood, you see things are tied with, with, the, um, with ropes and things like that and plastic materials. That's exactly how Gaza is working. With complete deprivation, they were still able to, put, to produce rockets, by the way, almost uh, standard, standard rockets. So they are not less efficient. They have about 15% of failure, but not that less efficient than standard rockets. And I suspect that that tells us something that even if you place a siege on Gaza, if your enemy is, is determined to replenish and, and rearm itself, they will be able to do that anyway, siege or no siege. Thank you very much. And the next question comes from Anthony Blake. Hi, um, Alon, very interesting talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, from a, let's say, sort of an English perspective, unfortunately, the press here is virulently anti-Israel. And we are all very, very concerned about the situation with Hezbollah because of what uh, they were able to do in Gaza and unleash an enormous amount of rockets, 
Uh, are you very concerned that Iran now might decide is the time for Hezbollah to release their, because they seem to have something like what, they've got something like 30,000 rockets, have they? Or, or, or no one 100, knows, 30. missiles, 100,000 missiles. But I mean, if they were to unleash the missiles and, uh, and uh, Gaza as well, what will the situation then be in terms of Andone? I believe that Iran will be hesitant to uh, use Hezbollah, especially now. Iran is focused on the big prize, which is about to be awarded to Iran by the US administration. And that prize is called the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. Once it will be granted in Vienna, and we believe that it might be in two weeks time, Iran is gaining everything back. It's gaining its money, its freezed assets, and its economy is allowed again to import, export. And Iran will not do anything right now that would jeopardize reaching that deal. So what they did allow Hezbollah to do is to unleash some Palestinian proxies in southern Lebanon, which fired several times on Israel from Lebanese soil, but without Hezbollah themselves being part of that. But Hezbollah understands that going into conflict with Israel would mean a complete destruction of Lebanon. Now, there was that, that was another reason for us to demonstrate our capabilities on Gaza in this conflict, because we wanted that to echo in Beirut and to make Hezbollah understand that we can do the same things to the tunnel dug underneath Beirut and to the tunnels dug in Southern Lebanon and to the high rises in Beirut, like we did to the high rises in Gaza. And I believe Hezbollah is watching and is concerned. Now Hezbollah understands that going into conflict with Israel, since there is so much energy uh, on both sides, once this energy is unleashed, it's going to be extremely violent, extremely short, and Lebanon would look differently. In that case, we will not be as surgical and as selective as we were in Gaza, because if we have, and this is not a paraphrase, if we have, 1,000 houses in Lebanon, which are residential buildings. Half of the building is residential apartments. Another half of the building is a silo for a heavy missile, 500 kilos, which is directed right now at me, at Tel Aviv. We will not wait for those 1,000 missiles to go out. We will destroy that building with the missile, yes, and with the people living inside it. <laughs> We will not wait for them to launch the missile on us. So Hezbollah understand that going to that might be their last shot. Because after that, who knows what kind of Lebanon would be and what kind of Hezbollah would be. So I believe that Iran will focus on the nuclear deal, would gain a lot of money from that nuclear deal that will, would enable them to uh, fund Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad much more generously than they did in the last few years because they had no cash and creating much more dangerous proxies in our borders, in Lebanon, in uh, Syria and in Gaza. And when I say Iran today, bear in mind that Iran today is Syria, Iran is Iraq, Iran is Lebanon, Iran is Yemen, and Iran is partly controlling Gaza through the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Iran is all over the place. And with more money, they are going to completely control the scene here. So that is, that is our main concern. We have tried to persuade our American friends to at least amend what we call the sunset clause. That is the clause defining the term of the nuclear agreement because under the agreement, the Americans are about to sign again. Iran in uh, 2023, two years time, is allowed to renew nuclear R&D. Iran in 2026 under that deal, five years time, is allowed to import spare parts for ballistic missiles. How does that promote any peace? And in 2030, and that's the worst part, Iran is relieved of its nuclear limitation. Basically, that deal gives Iran a license for a first nuclear weapon in 2030, and that would create a much more dangerous Middle East, both for the people in, of the Middle East, and I believe for the whole world as well. 
Next question from Anthony Lefko. Unmute, Anthony. Uh, my uh, question relates to the problem Israel has had by trying to minimize the number of casualties on the uh, Arab side. Uh, in general, wars are won after the other side gives up and they give up because they've lost so many people. For instance, in World War II, as you know, uh, the strategic bombing of Germany and the Soviet uh, artillery in the, Eastern, in the Eastern Front uh, made sure that Germany was willing to surrender. Now you have a situation in Gaza where they, uh, they'll take a ceasefire. But while the time expands, Tehran is busy getting, uh, working toward their nuclear weapons and uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is increasing their supply of weapons. And this is something that uh, shouldn't be allowed. And the only way you're going to get a, the surrender of the, uh, an Arab side is by increasing casualties, not paying too much attention to international uh, niceties and uh, limiting them. I ask you. Hamas logic is extremely the opposite. Hamas wants us to generate as many casualties as, as we can. Hamas wants their civilian killed because they understand that as, as the pile of casualties will rise, international forces will step in, will intervene, would limit Israel, and eventually will enforce a, a, a much harsher ceasefire on the Israeli side while embracing the Gaza side, which is, appears as the weak and the victim. So when we're talking about a fight, not between two independent nations, but with, between a nation, a state, and an organization, the organization adopts what we call the strategy of the weak. And that says, I want you to kill uh, Gaza children. I want you to kill Gaza women, because if I will get pictures of killed Gaza babies, I will have the whole world coming up against you. And that would serve me much better. So we are not playing according to that logic. And we do understand that the only way for a decisive victory over Hamas is if we take over the Gaza Strip. Now that bears terrible costs that I believe the, the Israeli society is not willing to pay these days in, in, in Israeli casualties, in the cost of legitimacy, in controlling once again, another 2 million Palestinians under our law. We don't want to go there. There is always a plan for that. And the IDF is always prepared for that. But I believe no sane Israeli prime minister would give the order to reoccupy that uh, hornet's nest, which is called the Gaza Strip. That is a, one big problem that we do not need to take on our side. I, I would like to keep them on the other side of the fence, but I need to understand that I, as an Israeli, have an interest that those people on the other side of the fence We'll have something to put in their stomach. We'll have fresh water to eat. And you know what? I want them to have something good in their life, something to wait for. You know, take a look at the West Bank. Imagine what the West Bank went through in the last five years, in the four years of the Trump administration. Uh, transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem. Deal of the century to which the Palestinians are no part. Uh, 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 threats of, uh, of annexation of the West Bank by Israel, which were not realized. Yet the West Bank, until the last few weeks, stayed calm. How so? Because people in the West Bank, they have a life. They work, they provide for themselves, they have money to buy food and place it on the, the children's table. And you know what? They're putting some money aside with a dream of sending the kid to study abroad. They have something to lose. And I want my neighbors to have something to lose because if they are desperate, they are coming to my doorstep and I don't want them to come. So I believe that we need to take a different look at Gaza 
And after trying basically the same tools, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2021, stop repeating the same action, hoping for a different outcome and start thinking, what are we doing to get out of this endless cycle of, of violence rounds? Next question is from Sharon Winchelbaum. Hi, thank you very much. Um, first, I want to say, I don't know if you can see my t-shirt, I'm the mom of a lone soldier. <laughs> so, um, thanks. So, um, I, I know that um, the Biden administration has uh, pledged to donate billions, I read billions of dollars, I don't know if it really is billions, <clears throat> but um, a lot of money is coming in from the United States, from Qatar, and the UN is supposed to be monitoring that. Do you trust the UN to, to do that responsibly and not let them re make new weapons? If you know the, the UN agencies operating in Gaza, you would understand that all of them are controlled by Hamas or accepting orders from Hamas. Basically, they have no independence. They live inside Gaza. Hamas is telling them what they what to do, and that's how they do that. So what we are trying and what we wanted to do is give the uh, authority to the do donating countries. For example, if Turkey wishes to donate, and they do wish, to donate a desalination uh, facility to Gaza, we want the Turks to be responsible to run the project while we are monitoring them from the outside, and that would be their own responsibility. If there are, for example, missing materials, we won't allow them to bring in new ones. If they are using those materials for other purposes, they will not be allowed to enter new ones. So we want those bodies. And by the way, today, <clears throat> with the post-corona world, no one has extra cash to give to Gaza. The only countries that could support Gaza are the Gulf countries, Qatar and the Emirates, maybe the Saudis, and the Turks, Egypt said they pledged 500 millions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I hope to live to see that day when Egypt donates 500 million to Gaza. They hate the Hamas and they hate the Gaza people. And uh, so what I think we need to do is to give those states, not international organizations, which are operating under Hamas, but state who are running the project. Yes, Hamas will cut off their own coupons from the Con, con, local contractors who are going to win the tenders. But those states will be responsible to monitor that everything we allow to enter Gaza is being used for the purpose that it, was, that it entered. And I, yes, I believe that we can do that. And I believe that we can need, give a greater role to those states, but that requires some flexibility from the Israeli side as well, to be honest. So far, we've been dragging our feet not letting most of those donations to go in. And Gaza today is in terrible shape, really. It's, it's, it's always in terrible shape. But after those 11 days in which the whole skyline of Gaza City has changed, and you've seen the pictures of the street, it, they have like three years of reconstruction there. And we need to start thinking who is going to fund and who is going to supervise that this reconstruction is, is uh, performed according to the commitments. Next question comes from Stuart Lockman. <clears throat> yes, in one of the reports that I saw, it said that um, the um, munitions were coming in mostly through the south um, and the part that's um, uh, connected to Egypt. And in addition to that, that um, Gaza was, had its own manufacturing capability um, for more weapons. Uh, do you know whether or not, first of all, the tunnel system in the South was, was bombed uh, as part of the campaign and whether that's effective in cutting off some of that? And second, with the same question with regard to the, um, the munitions that are being manufactured within uh, Gaza. That used to be true in the days of Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt. 
who is now, uh, you know, was, he was kicked out of power by, uh, by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. In the times of the Muslim Brotherhood, yes, that was the main route of supplying Gaza underneath the Gaza-Egyptian border. When Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power, he systematically destroyed the network of tunnels being dug underneath that border, cutting off basically the Sinai from Gaza. I believe that there are still some tunnels existing there. And when I say tunnel, you need to understand these were not narrow tunnels like the fighting tunnels we used to see. These were tunnels that they used to smuggle an SUV through. You can drive through the tunnel in, with an SUV. Hey, one time we saw the Palestinians using one of those tunnels to smuggle a giraffe to the Gaza Zoo. The poor thing, what they did to her, but she went through. And Sisi sealed that completely. And today, I think the number of weapons going from Egypt into Gaza is negligible. Most of the weapons we have encountered in this conflict were locally made, indigenously made by the Gazans using dual use materials that we are allowing into Gaza for all kinds of, of uh, industry and construction or, or fertilizers. And they know how to turn those materials into a rec rocket fuel and into a, a explosives. And they know how to manufacture quite good rockets. I have to say, I have to give it to them under very harsh conditions. They are quite effective. Now, can that be blocked? I'm, I'm not sure, you know, because at the end of the day, some dual use materials, you need to allow them to, to bring in, for example, fertilizers, which, which includes all kinds of uh, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, elements. How can you have a, a, an agriculture without using those kind of fertilizers? So they have the ability to produce most of the weapons themselves. If at some point, we will allow Gaza to have an opening to the world, either through an airport or a seaport, that would have to be under a very tight supervision mechanism that we are able to stop in real time any transfer that we consider to be suspicious. There have been quite a lot of work done on that in the IDF. This is an idea being promoted up by our finance minister, Israel Katz, for many years. Never got the attention of the Israeli cabinet, but something to look at. Because I see, you know, there, there are risks coming with that, but I see also some opportunities, you know. I, I saw a, a, a press report, TV report from Gaza, and this guy from Gaza said to the reporter, you know, if you will just open a crack in the Gaza gates, half of us are going to leave. Who wants to live here? We don't want to live here. Just give us the opportunity and we escape. And I say my Gazan borders, my Gazan neighbors, you know how much they love you in Europe? The Swedes are crazy about you. Go over there. The Germans, they love you. Go to Germany. Why come to me? I believe, you know, if you'll open um, a route from Gaza and connect it to the outer world, I believe that the, the population of Gaza will be depleted by half. Thank you. And our last question is from John Simon. Well, thank you very much. Alon, thank you uh, very much for uh, the talk that you've given. Uh, I've learned a lot of things that I haven't, uh, insights that I wasn't aware of before. My question is uh, twofold. Who else within uh, Israel shares your viewpoint? And where? what is the state of Hasbara today? Uh, is there, does the government recognize that it's losing the, it's losing the PR war? that it, the things that you have said and ways that you've explained it are, are I think, exemplary. Uh, why are we, aren't we hearing more of that from the Israeli government? What, where is, why aren't they doing a better job? And this has been going on for years. And uh, who has the ultimate authority for this improving the uh, uh, Hasbara? Is it, is it the, the, the foreign ministry? I believe that the, the analysis that I shared with you, um, the vast majority of the, of the military top brass as well as the Shin Bet uh, Internal Security Agency would subscribe to. 
I believe that most security and defense people, that's the way how they view the situation. As for Hasbara, and that connects to the previous answer, since we are in a constant internal political elections campaign, all of the energy is directed inside at their constituency. And politicians who are extremely gifted in using the media, in using the web to, to approach their own constituencies, they don't care about doing that abroad. Now, we used to have what we called a national Hasbara headquarters. It does not exist anymore. There's no person uh, in this position anymore. I've asked uh, Gabi Ashkenazi, the foreign minister, and he said, you know, I'm working uh, with governments. I'm not working with the publics and audiences. Um, no one is taking care of that. And at the end of the day, the state of Israel that knows how to build Iron Dome does not know how to market its own message in the, the, in the nowadays tools to masses around the world and no, except for some uh, 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 diligent Israeli civilians who are taking that upon themselves. The government is hardly doing anything to convey the message to the audiences uh, overseas. And that's a shame because at the end of the day, you know, yeah, I, I've, I've heard this, uh, this British guy saying, but you had so few, such few dead, you are protected and they are not protected. Well, excuse me for not dying enough. I think we did that before. We are not going to go there once again. We have demonstrated our ability to die in large numbers. We are not going there again. So please forgive us. Thank you, Alon. And thank you for all those who asked questions. I'll now turn the program to Brian Taub to conclude for today. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Lehi. My name is Brian Taub. I'm the chair for Tampa, Florida for Israel Bonds, and I'm also on the National Council. On behalf of Israel Bonds, I'd like to extend a sincere appreciation to Alan Ben David for his insights and the chilling reality of what's going on in Israel today. I also ask that you consider an investment in Israel bonds. From the Sinai campaign, which was the first conflict after the establishment of the State of Israel, until Operation Guardian of the Walls, which hopefully will be concluded now, Israel bonds has been a definitive means of solidarity with the State of Israel. And in the famous words of our founder, the founder of Israel Bonds, David Ben-Gurion, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. Please help us keep the miracle of Israel alive. Please invest in Israel Bonds and keep Israel as the Jewish, the only Jewish state in the world. Thank you very much. This concludes the briefing. Thank you all and thank you for your support to our country. We appreciate that.